I'm now speaking with John Heimlich, who's <coughs> senior economist at the Air Transport Association in Washington. John, thank you for, for talking with me. I'd like to talk with you about biofuels, and if you could share some thoughts on the economics of biofuels, I've heard that the pricing is an issue. The price point at which biofuels is, is trading at now compared to fossil fuels right now. Could you share some thoughts on, on how you see that? Sure, and it's my pleasure to talk to you about this. I have a passion for this topic. Uh, basically, we are, we are looking at making sure that these are competitive at scale. Not a gallon here and there, but millions, billions of gallons, ultimately competitive at any point in the future with petroleum-based jet fuel. Uh, I think what we see is a future where you know, every five years or, or so, the trend for petroleum-based jet is an upward trend. And with all the things we're doing, the government's doing, the costs of biofuels will come down over time. And at some point, those curves will cross. Like all the work we're doing today is to accelerate that timeline. So we can't pick one price per se, and there's a range across different conversion technologies and different feedstocks uh, and transportation fuel costs. Uh, but we, we are believers that this will give us another uh, choice in the toolkit. We want to diversify our supply chain. So we do believe that we can get there. What do you think about timing in terms of, the, when you talk about the crossover point, I think the timing is, then becomes quite a critical factor. You're saying you would like to see accelerated. I think a lot of people would like to see that happen. Sure. So we have some small projects uh, expected to come online in 2014, 2015 timeframe. I wouldn't expect any type of significant volumes before the year 2020. Uh, but I think, again, the, the key is that we want to pull the market in our direction uh, meaning toward aviation fuels, not diesel, not uh, power generation, uh, not cars. Uh, we see us ourselves as a first mover using this fuel globally, and the more we do today uh, through long-term offtake agreements, through R&D, through uh, partnerships, tax credits, those sorts of things, we can shave time. Uh, off that horizon. So when I hear people say, well, this is 20, 30 years away, I say, well, it will be if we do nothing. But we could shave a decade or so off that timeline. So I would like, I would like to say we'll see meaningful volumes in the next decade with small projects here and there today. It's so important that we validate the business model. It's what we call proof of concept. If we can get at least one or two supply chains making biojet fuel in the United States, then the floodgates will open. I think the investment community <clears throat> and others will, and, and suppliers will be more interested in being able to do this. Do you think the industry could do this? The, when I say the industry, I mean the, supplying, the supply chain. Mm -hmm. Do you think they could have managed to do this without subsidies from, from the government? Uh, eventually, yes. In the near term, they need some assistance. Most have uh, some type of assistance, but uh, most of them have cost curves that come down over the life of, let's say, a seven to ten year contract. It's the near term bridging, that jump start, that most any industry has needed, including way back in the day, petroleum had help from the government. So if we can bridge the near term risk, then yes, I think we can get to a point where these are viable on their own. In terms of feasibility, I guess you, you, you may have come across the Detroit airport doing a test or like a pilot program with the University of Michigan to grow, I think it's mustard seed they want to grow on some of the land of the airport. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it sounds to me like a great idea that even the airports, are, or here's an airport that's trying to also focus on a problem which is everybody in the air transportation business should be concerned with. Is that, is, is that kind of thing feasible to, to see potentially that airports also get involved in, in helping to work through this process and, as you say, to shave the timeline? Well, generally speaking, yes. I don't know all the technical aspects of that particular project. My deputy, Steve Barker, actually attended the meetings in Wayne County and is working on that, and, and he's the, the more technical expert than I. I but it, as a general uh, notion, yes, we applaud airports and all elements of the supply chain 
who want to help make this work and actually the, this, the places where this is likely to move first is where there's a strong local organization. It could be the airports, the state economic development agency, the local USDA rep, the business community. That's really a strategic investor. That's what's going to grease the wheels in Detroit, in Wayne County, uh, Georgia, Ohio. There, there are certain places that are showing leadership, and that makes life easier for us. In terms of creating a, a supply chain, a steady supply chain, as you pointed out at the beginning here, we're talking, you're talking about millions at least, but probably billions of gallons. And it's a global thing. Everybody needs to be involved. There's space for everybody. There's a geography issue here then, right? Everybody's trying to, to create some sort of feedstock that's going to end up with the right molecule at the back end that can be dropped into the existing fuel supply. What are your thoughts on the geography um, and how this plays out around the world to create that supply chain? Well, one thing I would say, as you said, everyone's trying to create a feedstock. In some cases, they're trying to create one. In other cases, we're trying to leverage existing feedstocks through different processes or conversion technologies. And it's the beauty of the ASTM specification process or approach that they're approving technologies, not feedstocks, technologies to, to accommodate process multiple types of feedstocks into jet fuel so that the performance characteristics end up essentially the engine thinks it's getting uh, jet A, today's petroleum-based jet fuel. Uh, that means different feedstocks in different parts of the country, indeed different parts of the globe, are going to, to work uh, better than others. Uh, any given feedstock like a Camelina or a Jatropha or a, a Pennycrest, they're not going to be algae universally present to the extent that oil tends to be. And we have to be uh, cognizant of the, you know, the agricultural conditions, the meteorological conditions. So security is important uh, of supply. I see this as an opportunity. Uh, one, we could situate facilities more proximate to the airports or to the pipelines, out of harm's way, Mother Nature, uh, minimize transportation costs, undercut some transportation differentials, uh, and, and give ourselves other options. And, and yes, what works in uh, Malaysia might be different than what works in uh, the state of Texas. And that is why it's so important that we pursue this third pathway too, the alcohol to jet process, because if we have a portfolio of conversion technologies, that's going to open up the door to more um, economically viable solutions in different parts of the world. But we're, we're obviously more focused on the United States, but this is an international effort, and uh, you know, we exhibited this at Paris Air Show. We've talked to this, everyone from the Singapore Air Force to... The Australian government, and it's a very exciting endeavor. So we, we, we could in fact see within a decade or let's say 15 years, the airline industry really having an alternative to fossil fuels. Yeah, I mean technically we have an alternative today, it's just in minimal production and somewhat minimal use. I mean Lufthansa and KLM have signed deals, uh, the, the US airlines have signed letters in t of intent for a biomass based project in Gilroy, California. We're, we're looking at another one in the West Coast. Uh, so technically we have alternatives today, they're just not in mass production. That's what we have to get to. Uh, it's, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. Uh, every, you know, what is it, the last eight presidents have given speeches on energy independence and everyone's sort of, it's 100% or nothing. I would say no, if the last eight presidents did 10% each, we'd be here somewhere today. Thank you. You're welcome.